If you would please turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 7 is where we are in our text this morning. Uh, as I mentioned in the call to worship, this last Sunday we were at my parents' church in Oklahoma. Um, that's the church I grew up at. That's the church my father still preaches for. Um, a lot of people I love very dearly at that church. And what happens at that church on the fifth Sunday, every time there's a fifth Sunday, they have a guest speaker. Okay, so four times a year there's a guest speaker for those fifth Sundays. And since we happen to be there for the fifth Sunday, they asked me if I wouldn't mind guest speaking, which is always great at my home church because they're always just like, oh, little David's up there preaching. It's so great. Okay, because I'm like 12 to them, which is great. I know I'm not much older than that to you, but still. I'm 12 years old at that church and will always be 12 years old at that church, and that's okay. Okay, so my father was going to introduce me to preach for the congregation, and what he intended to say was, it's the fifth Sunday. What we normally do on the fifth Sunday is invite a good preacher to come and be with us, but this Sunday we have a great preacher be, to be with us, my son, David. Okay, that would have been a great introduction, if only he had said that. <clears throat> Instead, what he said was, normally on the fifth Sunday, we get a good preacher. But this Sunday, we have my son, David. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I appreciate what he was trying to do, but he got it backwards. All right, and you think about it, there's a lot of things that we get backwards. A lot of times we have good intentions and tend to do things one way, but we get it backwards. You know, I hope that you all thoroughly enjoyed your Thanksgiving feasts, but we actually get Thanksgiving backwards. Okay, did you know when the Puritans first celebrated Thanksgiving, they did not do it with a feast, they did it with a fast. If you really want to be grateful for all the food and provision God has given you, you don't spend your day shoving as much of it down your throat as you can. You spend a day going without it, and after a day of not eating, you will be really grateful for everything God has given you. Not a feast, a fast. We get it backwards. Okay, we do this spiritually all the time. You know, we think that loving ourselves is the best way to get love, but God says no. He says, you want to experience love, you learn how to love others. We get it backwards. God says to love our enemies. He says to rejoice when we are persecuted. He says to sit at the lowest seat of the table. He says, you want to be a leader? Then serve. He says to forgive instead of get even. He says it's better to give than receive. Spiritually speaking, there are lots of things we get backwards because the values of the kingdom of God are so different than the values of this world. And it's difficult for us oftentimes to turn our minds around from the ways that are in our culture and instead embrace the values of the kingdom of God. Now, I tell you all of that because our text this morning is difficult. As we read through Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I want you to notice just how backwards this sounds. Okay, in fact, as I read this text, my first inclination is to say, he's wrong. Okay, it just does not sound right. Some of this I agree with pretty readily, but some of this just sounds so backwards. Okay, so I want you to notice that as we read our text this morning. Start Ecclesiastes 7 in verse 1. It says, a good name is better than fine perfume." And the day of death, better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter. Because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This, too, is meaningless. Okay, think of some of those phrases that just sound wrong, just sound backwards. He says, death is better than birth, mourning better than feasting, sorrow better than laughter. Hey, again, I want to argue with him. You know, we're getting ready to go into the holidays. One of the reasons that we like the holidays is because we celebrate a birth, 
We spend time feasting. We enjoy ourselves with laughter. I find it difficult to agree with Ecclesiastes 7. In fact, I think one of the reasons we don't often study Ecclesiastes in church is because of passages like this one. Okay, is it just me or does anyone else find this backwards? It's just me. Okay, and six of you. All right, that's fine. Okay, what is he doing? Why does he try to convince us that sorrow and mourning and death are preferable to the things that we normally pursue and celebrate? What is he talking about? All right, well, I know it's been a couple of weeks, but I want to remind you of the context. Okay, the last sermon we had from this book a couple of weeks ago talked about some of the different things that we pursue as we try to find meaning and happiness in our lives. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that we chase, right? We chase money, we chase health, we chase power and influence. And we tend to think, well, you know, if I could just get those things, if I could just get a little bit more money, if I could just get more pleasure in my life, if I could just get in the right position, maybe get that raise or that job at work that I really want, if I could just get whatever that is, then I would be happy, then I would be content, then everything in my life would be great. Okay? And so much of this book is teaching us all of those pursuits are illusions, Okay, even if you won the lottery tomorrow, even if you got that big promotion, even if you took that ultimate vacation and it was everything you wanted it to be, you still wouldn't be closer to finding real meaning in your life. He says we've got to look somewhere else if we want real meaning. Okay, and where he's turning towards the middle of this book is he's teaching us if you want meaning in your life, if you want something that's more than just a momentary happiness you get from pleasure, then the only way to get there is to develop a certain kind of wisdom. Okay, in fact, when the, the Jewish people categorize the different texts of Scripture, they categorize Ecclesiastes as wisdom literature. This is one text to teach us how to be wise. Okay, we need to find a wisdom that can only come from God. And in the first six verses of chapter 7, he's making a very important point to us about how to get that wisdom. Okay, write this down if you're taking notes. He teaches us that wisdom comes in living with the knowledge of death. If you want to be wise, if you want your life to mean something, you have to live with the knowledge that you will someday die. You know, we don't often look to American Idol winners for profound theological wisdom, uh, but we will this morning. Because the guy that won a couple years back was a singer named Chris Allen. He came out with a song. They still sing it on the fish quite regularly. I'm going to resist the urge to sing it to you this morning. Okay, but I want you to notice the lyrics from this song, Chris Allen's hit, Live Like We're Dying. He says, yeah, we got to start looking at the hands of the time we've been given. If this is all we got, then we got to start thinking. If every second counts on a clock that's ticking, got to live like we're dying. I think Ecclesiastes would agree wholeheartedly with the lyrics of the song. He says, if you want to live a better life, you want to live a more meaningful life, then you have to live with the understanding you've only been given so much time. You're not going to live forever. Someday will come the end of your life. You don't know how much time you have, but how foolish would it be for us to live as if we're never going to die? He says, wisdom comes in living with the knowledge that we will all someday die. You know, you can see this play out a little bit in our world around us just by looking at the way different generations handle money. You know, you look at people in their teens and 20s. Okay, most young people tend to spend all the money they have assuming, well, I've got plenty of time in my life to make more money. Okay, the vast majority of debt that people accrue in their lives happen during those early adult years. Okay, middle-aged people change the way they view money. Right? They typically start saving as much money as they can because they realize retirement's coming. I don't want to run out of money. I need to make a big enough pile of money to last me to do all the things I want to do. Okay, the vast majority of IRA contributions are made by people in their 40s and 50s. Okay, past that, older people, they start giving money away. They start giving their possessions away because they finally realize, you know what? I'm not going to be here forever. And people are more important than possessions. 
You know, you look just again, generally speaking, but typically the closer a person comes to the day of their death, the more their priorities with the way they use their resources line up with the kingdom of God. Okay, notice again what he says in verse 1. He says, a good name is better than fine perfume, which again, I can agree with that part. That makes good sense. He says, but the day of death is better than the day of birth. I've been to a bunch of funerals, I've been to a bunch of births, and I know I would much rather go celebrate with you at the hospital, celebrating a new grandchild or a new child, than I would go to your funeral, right? But notice, he's not talking about which experience is more enjoyable. What he's trying to teach us is which experience gives us greater wisdom. He says, at the end of the day, you get a lot more wisdom attending a funeral than you will the birth of a child. You know, I know that I'm still rather young by modern standards. If I live a typical adult lifetime in American culture, I still have more life ahead of me than I do behind me. Although in the days of Ecclesiastes, I would be past midlife. All right, but I am old enough, even though I'm still relatively young, I'm old enough to have put to death many of the dreams that I have had for myself. And that's okay. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. I I remember growing up watching the Braves on TBS, thinking, I want to play for the Atlanta Braves when I grow up. A little later in life, I thought, well, that's not going to work out, so I want to be a professional golfer. I will never do either of those things. Okay, those dreams have died. As a young adult, I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to design things. I will never fulfill that dream. When I got into theology studies, I wanted to become an Old Testament professor. I thought that would be really cool to go teach at one of our Christian universities, Old Testament theology. Right now I have made, I continue to make education decisions, time decisions that close that door to me. That dream is dying. You know, as we walk down life's path, as we make choices about which roads we will take, inevitably we close other doors to other paths that maybe we could have taken. You know, as we recognize our own limitations, many of our dreams will die. I was never going to get to play baseball for Atlanta, no matter how much I would have wanted to, because God didn't give me that talent. That's part of life. You can't do everything. And now, the wise person admits that, right? The wise person knows that their time is limited. We know that our abilities are limited. Resources are limited. Life is limited, and that's okay. Okay, wise people know they only have a short time on earth, and so we live in that reality. We make choices with our eyes open. The foolish person is the person who can't accept that, who still lives as if they will live forever, who still makes plans as if they will never grow old. Okay, the fool can't handle mourning. The fool can't handle fasting. Instead, the fool constantly wants to party, runs from one pleasure to the next, tries to keep coming up with new dreams to keep living that life of pleasure because they can't embrace wisdom. You know, this is just my personal opinion. If you want to disagree with this, that's completely fine. You're wrong, but you can disagree with that and that'll be fine. But I think one of the things that we have lost through the centuries that that I regret and wish we could get back is the concept of a Christian calendar. You know, long ago, the church had designated days of celebrations and feasts, times of joy and praise. They also had set aside times of reflection and remembrance and more somber occasions, periods of lament. And this comes straight out of Judaism where God designed feasts and designated fasts, right? God built it into the schedule of his people to take times of regular somber reflection and regular times of joy because God knows that to live a balanced life, we need both of those things. We need to know how to celebrate and enjoy ourselves. We also need to know how to have periods of reflection and mourning and lamentation. Okay, what we've tended to do though over the centuries is we've kept the feast, but we've thrown out the fasts. Okay, we kept the parties and the celebrations, but we got rid of anything that might be unpleasant in any way. Okay, so today you can go to lots of churches and find a great, uplifting, joyful Easter service. Okay, we'll have a big party. It's harder to find a good Friday service. Okay, and if you go to most churches for the Easter service, it's hard to find a seat. 
if you do find a Good Friday service, you can sit anywhere you want. It's pretty easy. Like the fool of Ecclesiastes 7, we chase pleasure as hard as we can, and we avoid reality at any cost. And so he says, the reason that mourning is better than feasting and sorrow is better than laughter is because it's the fool who turns a blind eye to the harder things we deal with in life and constantly wants to be partying, never grows up, and never knows how to truly live life. Because the only reason we can celebrate on Sunday is because Friday happened. You don't get the celebration, you don't get to truly enjoy life to its fullest unless you also know how to have the other side of it. Does that make sense? Okay, so remember, God created every pleasurable thing that exists, right? We finished last week's sermon, the end of chapter 5, talking about how it's good for us to eat, drink, be merry, enjoy the pleasurable things God has given us. Okay, God created those things for us to enjoy them. But there is so much more to life than just having a good time. If all we focus on is the good time, we will ultimately end up miserable because there's no meaning in that. There's a time to laugh, a time to cry. If all we do is laugh, we're turning a blind eye to the world and we're acting like fools. Wisdom comes with a knowledge of death. All right, go back to your text. Notice again Ecclesiastes 7, because starting in verse 7, he describes what kind of life this will make. He describes how it's different if we will live with this kind of wisdom and how the wise man is separated from the fool. Okay, notice verse 7. He says, extortion turns a wise person into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter, but the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. All right, so starting with these verses, he lays out how we can live like a fool and how we can live like the wise man. He says you take a more realistic view of life that has some very practical applications. Okay, ultimately, this is number two on your outline if you're taking notes. He's teaching us that wisdom makes for a better life than pleasure. You can either chase wisdom with your life or you can chase pleasure, but you can't chase pleasure with all your might and claim that you're being wise. Okay, three quick thoughts on this and then we'll be done. And the first one is this, is that fools live for the moment. Okay, fools live for the moment. As I've already said a bunch of times, we recently took a trip to Oklahoma. Uh, Before we went, one of the things Rachel and I did is we checked the weather. Okay, saw what the weather was going to be like. It's going to be cold there, so we packed warmer things to wear and jackets and those kinds of things. Okay, we made plans for how long we would be gone. We counted how many clothes we would need. We packed up everything, right? We were planning for the future. We told our two-year-old and six-year-old, we're going to Gigi's house later. What they immediately did is they walked to the door, right? Because where are they going? Gigi's house, okay? They didn't check the weather, My six-year-old didn't count how many days he would be gone and plan his wardrobe accordingly. They weren't planning for the future at all. They just saw, oh, this is the next thing I want to do. Let's go do that now. Now, I hope as they become adults, they will outgrow that impulse, right? Instead, they will become wiser. They'll make plans for the future. They won't just live in the moment. But how sad is it when we as adults chase one shiny thing after the next, one pleasure after the next, Instead of planning for the future, we just live for the moment. Okay, don't be that fool. All right, notice what he says, verse 8. He says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Okay, we need to live lives of wisdom. Realize that only fools live just for the moment. Okay, the next thing he says comes in verse 9. Notice the next thought. He said, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Okay, his second point is this, is that fools quickly become angry. And one of the ways that you can judge how wise you are is ask yourself, how easy is it for you to get angry? How easy is it for someone else to provoke you to anger? 
Now again, anger in and of itself is not wrong. Jesus gets angry, so does God. Okay, but one of the things we're told constantly in Scripture is that the Lord is slow to anger. Okay, and when Jesus got angry in Scripture, he never lost control. All right? How quickly are you provoked to anger? You know, most of the things that I've said in my life that I regretted, I said when I was angry. Okay, that's not wise. That's foolish. All right, the third thing is this, is that fools want to escape reality. Okay, fools want to escape reality. Notice again verse 10. He says, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Okay, now again, I don't care if you want to spend a little bit of time reminiscing about the good old days, but you can't live in the good old days. You know, one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, a great theological piece is Napoleon Dynamite. Have you seen that movie? It's got a lot of wisdom in that movie. Okay, one of the best scenes of that movie is Uncle Rico throwing a football in front of a camera, and Uncle Rico is like in his mid-30s, okay, but he's talking about, if I could just go back, if I could just go back to 1982, there's no doubt in my mind that we would have won the state championship. Okay, and it's hysterical because it's this middle-aged guy trying to live as if he's back in high school again. Okay? And the point, I think, is a good one, is you can't live in the past. You can't be the fool who's holding on to some pleasure from your past and trying to relive in that. Instead, we need to be people of wisdom who embrace reality, recognize that God's the one in control of it. And again, we have to live with our own death in mind. Hey, I know that sounds a little bit morbid, but all of us need to live a life that recognizes that we could die today. Hey, you could get in a car accident on the way home today, and you could die. Are you living life as if each day could be your last day? Do we truly live with the knowledge that sooner or later, every one of us will stand before our Creator and give an account for the things that we have done? At this time in our service, we are going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. Uh, during the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. We would love to talk with you or pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. Uh, if you haven't become a Christian, this morning would be a great time for you to make that decision. Again, none of us knows how much time we truly have left. We need to make the most of every opportunity. Uh, let's live lives of wisdom. At this time, the invitation is for you. If you have a need, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.